Hello and welcome back to the third in this three-part video series, Successful Show Jumping, with me, Tim Stockdale. Today I'm going to be talking about training and competition at a more advanced level, I'm trying to give you helpful tips on successful show jumping. Before we start any show jumping, we've got to warm up. What most people do is they just trot the horse round, basically trying to get the horse to blow. That's actually incorrect. What you should be trying to do is go through your little repertoire of skills, making sure the horse is relaxing, but also working. A little bit like a tennis player, before he plays a match, will play different sort of shots just to make sure that he can play his forehand and his backhand, as well as his serve and his lob. When we're working our horses, we're checking through that the horse is relaxed, but also that he's able to extend, compress, relax and soften going through the turns, the flying changes. When we warm up for a competition, we want to test the horses, go deep, a little close to the fence, move up the pace. Again, the sort of skills that you're going to need in the ring. So don't just trot round willy-nilly. Actually think what you're going to do and think what the horse is doing underneath you. I'm going to do a little warming up session before I start now. I'm just going to give you a little commentary of what's going through my mind. First thing we do is relax the mare, or relax the horse, in the walk. Just get it, again, it's just a soften and a little flexion either side. Oh, just again to make sure that she's not tightening against our hand. Allowing the head and neck here to be soft and flexible. Not trying to ask too much at this stage, just getting her to relax her lower jaw and to bend gently round our hands. Again, the contact should always be elastic so as to go with the horse. The trot to start with a very simple trot, rising to start with. Again, the rising trot keeps the horse's back nice and soft and loose. Not asking for too much shape or outline at this stage, just again, a little flexion in the contact, just to make sure the horse isn't leaning on our hands. Through the turn making sure that she's bending around our leg correctly. Little serpentine and changing the diagonal. At all times in your work, work equally left and right. Getting a little agitated there. Um, a raindrop actually fell in her ear. There we go. Again, a little bending, making sure that she's bending around our leg in the conventional manner. Again, you'll notice by my hand position that it's a little higher, but it's following the contours of the rein directly into the horse's mouth and bit. So again, to be able to give and to take, as we discussed in videos one and two. Now I'm going to do a little bit of sitting trot. But here, I'm just going to be asking the horse for a little more outline and a little more bend. A little more bend through the, tur through the turns, asking her to move away gently from my leg. Again, you'll notice the contact is even throughout both hands. A little bit the other way as well. Just gently asking her to flex through the front, head and neck, but not lean on my hands. A good tip to find this out, if your horse is leaning on your hand, is to gently just give the rein and see what reaction you get. There, she just extends her head down. She didn't get faster. She just extended the head down. 
Therefore, she's balancing herself correctly and not using my hands to lean on. Too many riders support their horse too strongly in their hand, and as a result of which, the horse becomes rigid and uses the hand as almost a fifth leg to balance on. Little bit of moving away from the leg, just a little leg yield, and then go straight. And again, I'll do that the other way. Little bit of leg yield, and then go straight. Again, to make sure she's nice and responsive from my aids. Whoa, good girl. Okay, what I then do, just to make sure she is listening to me, is I'm going to be asking her to go directly from a transition of walk to canter, missing out the trot. This will help her engagement behind, but like I said, it will also check that she's listening to me. That was a nice, solid strike off. And again, she's gone into a very soft and supple canter. I'm going to go large. And again, keeping the contact, flexing gently left to right. My body living with the canter, not working against it. Allowing the canter to develop the cog, the rhythm. As I explained on video one and two, the cog or the rhythm is the key to our work. And here you'll see my horse is keeping a nice rhythm throughout, very balanced, without me having to work too hard at maintaining the canter. I'm now going to put in a tighter turn, the sort of thing that you might need in the ring. Just to check that she's bending around my leg, but again, she's keeping engaged and balanced through her turn. A little flying change. Across the centre, nice and balanced. And again, a nice turn on the other rein. You'll notice again as I'm coming towards camera, how I gently just ask for a little flexion, both left and right, to gain to make sure that she's not leaning on my hands. We'll try a sharper turn on the left rein now, again just to see whether she's being balanced and holding herself through the turns without having to be supported too much by me as the rider. The rain's slightly upsetting her, but I'm going to keep working her because if we were in competition and it started to rain, we wouldn't be able to stop, we'd have to carry on. So she's got to learn that these conditions they're not perfect or ideal, she still has to concentrate. Rather like an athlete running a race in the Olympics or the World Championships, if it starts to rain, they've still got to be able to focus. So it's a good idea to keep working your horses, even if the weather isn't perfect. I'm now going to ask her to extend and open the canter, go through the gears. So I'm going to, little leg pressure, still keeping the contact, ask her to open the stride pattern. Now, by using a little bit of body movement, just to bring my body back slightly and a little closure in my hand, I hope to concertina the canter and close the canter down. Go bigger. And a little closure. So again, just gently going through the gears that I might need when I'm jumping my rounds. Little flying change there. Again, trying to keep my body balanced with the horse through the change. Again, going through the gears, a little extension in the canter. 
I'm bringing my body slightly up off the vertical, a little closure in my hand, asking the horse to shorten. One more, a little closure with my leg, open the canter out, bring my body back off the vertical, gentle con contact in the hand, and close the canter down. Whoa. Good girl. You'll notice there that when I started my instructions to move up, or indeed to come back down, that it was all very gentle and subtle. That's when your horse is listening to you. If you're having to tell him three or four times the instruction, the chances are that he's got his mind on other things. Practice that. When you ask your horse to do something like extend, if he doesn't listen to you first time, make sure the instruction is given more firmly so that he can't, as it were, uh, cock a deaf one. In other words, not listen to you. It's really important that your horse is responsive and by doing so, then you'll have the confidence to be able to ride the round because you know your horse is working with you. That was a simple little program there just to show you the type of thing that I always do with my horses before we start jumping them. The horse has to be not only warmed up in his body, but his mind must be ready to accept the work we're going to do. If that doesn't happen, that will not lead to successful training. Now we're going to come to our grid work for today. It's quite an advanced grid that I'm going to show you today. It's basically multiple bouncers. What I mean by that is that we're going to have six bouncers all in a row. It's quite an advanced type of grid and it's in a special way that I do it. I do it with diagonally slanting bouncers. This I do for two reasons. The main reason is the safety aspect. When you're jumping multiple bouncers suspended in the normal way, if a horse was to get trapped or entangled in one, because it's suspended, it's more likely to bring the horse down, therefore cause a serious accident. By having them slanted with only one end suspended, that way if there's a problem, the horse just has to go to the low side, and by the same token, only one end can fall on the floor, and therefore no accidents occur. The other thing that this bounce does it really challenges the horse optically. Because of the way the horse sees, it's going to look like a lot of cross poles in its way, when actually there's a space in between for it to get a, a landing distance. But it will not only challenge it in the actual suppleness and the work that it has to do, it'll challenge its brain into interpreting what it's seeing into the puzzle, as it were, that it's then got to work out. It's also very important that the rider's balance is maintained throughout all of these multiple bouncers. Therefore, it's a very good indicator for you as a rider to be able to feel where your balance is going. Because of the timing involved, if you slightly are behind your movement through the first and second bounce, by the time you get down to number six, you'll be nearly sitting on its tail. If indeed you're too far forward in your body position, a little in front of your horse. By the time you get down to number five and six, you'll be nearly over its ears. So again, it's a really good indicator for a rider to feel the balance. Don't forget, the bounce is nothing more than an exaggerated stride. And again, this links totally in with all the work we've been doing so far in videos one and two, and the key to good show jumping is a good quality stride. So again, all these things, like a chain, link into each other, and that's what gives us the strength in our training. As I said, we're coming in canter. The main key to this grid is not to come in too forward. I'm using the white pole on the floor to create the round stride. Ride nice and straight and balanced. Little change of leg, alternate the rein, go left. Tip for you riders on a sharp turn. Look at the fence nice and early. That'll help you gauge where the fence is. Nice and soft, 
body balanced, ride forward, turning right. We're now going to put a second part in. Bearing in mind we discussed about the takeoffs and landings in video two, we allow half a stride for takeoff, half a stride for landing, and the stride being four of my paces, 12 feet long, 3.65 meters. A bounce really when you add the landing and the takeoff together is four yards, 12 feet. Today I'm going to be working at a little shorter than that. I'm going to be working at three and a half of my normal steps, around about 10 feet six. The reason I want to do that is because I want to really define the bounce. I don't want it to be too long. Just to walk the distance for you, looking up from the centre, one, two, three, and a half. And that'll be about 10 feet six. You'll see I've got it suspended on only one side, sloping diagonally. What I'm going to be doing is, and this is very important that you remember this, that when you come for the first time, and this today, it'll be on the right rein, that the first diagonal must be the opposite side. The reason we do this is to encourage the horse to finish his turn. If indeed we came on the left rein the first time, we would encourage our horse to jump over the uh, small side. And therefore, when we add bounce two, three, four, five, and six, you'll see that the horse will not get straight when he comes in. So always remember that whichever side you start your diagonal on to come on the opposite rein, and that'll get the horse nice and straight from the prime position one to two. The horse is going to land in this area here. And what he's going to do in the bounce, again like I described in video two, is as soon as he lands, it will create a jump again from its front end. The back end is still in the air. So at this point, the rider has got to be off the seat and allowing the legs and knees to act as shock absorbers. The balance, again, like I discussed, must be maintained and keep the head up so as to allow the horse to go about his work. One other little thing to remember, don't throw the contact away because if you do that, then the horse will go down here willy-nilly. What will happen, the more you develop this grid with two, three, four and five added to it, as the horse will start to go down and gradually it will start to do almost that type of thing where it will start to use the whole of its body. A little bit like a footballer practicing uh, weaving down some cones. The horse will use his whole body going down there. Really important by keeping balanced. The horse is having to think about balancing itself rather than trying to balance you as a rider as well as do the bouncers. Bearing in mind at all times that the bounce again is nothing more than an exaggerated stride. All we're doing is elevating that stride and creating strength from our jump. We're coming in on the right rein at canter. Again, looking at my fence nice and early, feeling the horse's rhythm underneath. Being disciplined not to go in too forward, nice and gentle, off the seat, keep off the seat, looking up. Follow him with the contact, turn left. Again, okay, one time on the left rein. Nice smooth turn, not too forward in, keeping nice and straight, looking up, allowing the body to be soft with the horse, turning right. Now we're going to add Now we're going to add the third in our series. In other words, the second bounce, the third obstacle, but the second bounce. And this is where it really, the key to this grid, we made it the opposite side. So we've got a high side on the left going in this way. Then we make it the opposite to the right. Straight away, this is doing two things. Visually, as the horse comes in, He's starting to see all these poles in front of it. Because the way the horse sees, 
the perception and the focus isn't like ours. So it will only actually be able to focus on bounce two and three, literally as it is landing after the first cross pole. So what will happen is, as the horse is going down, it will all be start to become clear, but only as he's getting quite close to it. So it will show a degree of faith in you as a rider when you're asking your horse to come and do this, that he actually does it systematically and doesn't panic straight away and go, oh, I'm not doing that, that looks too difficult. If at any time your horse has a problem with this type of bounce, don't be frightened to take one or two away, gain the trust and confidence again, and then rebuild. With most things in life, when you're asking for more uh, testing things, you might make a mistake. It's very often the way that you come back, get the confidence of the horse again, and then rebuild. This is where you'll start to feel your horse moving slightly from left to right, back to the left to right again. Indeed, what you might see as well as you're doing that is the horse starting to change the legs in front. These again are all very good things from the horse's point of view that he's actually starting to think what he's doing with his body. And as you appreciate from any athlete, the moment they get control over their bodies, they're able to then use themselves better and that's where successful show jumping really starts to pay dividends in training in this type of fashion. I said about listening to the horse. In other words, what your horse is feeling. Now we've got two parts, not two forward. There we go. Little flying change, turn left. Keeping my body balanced with the horse throughout this exercise. It's really important that your body must be balanced. Then the horse doesn't have to balance you. Nice smooth turn, keeping straight. Go with the horse looking up. Feel what's happening. Nice sit up, turning right. We've added the number four of our line, which is the bounce number three. Again, reverting back to the opposite side for the high side again. The other thing I would say to you, don't be frightened to start off nice and small and build up. It's all a question of gaining confidence and trust with your horse. So you don't have to start off at this height. Indeed, you can start off really quite small and then gently build each one up as it gets used to doing this type of thing. One very important thing to remember, as you're building this, keep giving your horse a little breather. There's quite a lot of strain put on the horse's front legs in this exercise. Remembering it's actually, as it lands, it is then having to take off directly using the forearm. Normally, it would be using the back end to do this. By giving the horse a little breather in between each time you build up and extend the exercise, you'll be starting to allow the horse to get his feeling back almost. A little bit like carrying heavy shopping bags, maybe to the, to the car. When you get to the car, you drop your, oh, your arms have gone a little dead. Same thing, let the horse have a little breather in between so as to get his forearms working again, and that way he's not going to stumble through this exercise. The more you add the bouncers, the more there is so much information the horse has got to take in. Keep the horse soft and relaxed. I said earlier, be responsive to what the horse is telling you. If, as you develop this bounce, he starts to feel a little bit frightened, then build his confidence up before you go on. Don't just build it up and up and up until he starts to have a problem and panics. Confidence is the key. It's such a complicated grid, such as this. And really, you've got to be receptive all the time to what your horse is telling you. One other little tip that I'd like to say, because the horse is having to use his body to almost create momentum, as he lands, he'll lower the front end, so therefore 
he's really developing a nice bascule technique. The other thing that he might do to start with is he might run a little bit. In other words, he might over-exaggerate the forward momentum. And again, you'll feel that. If that happens, come in and sit a little soft, but try just to keep your contact to say, hey, don't get too big, don't get too forward. And the more he does it, the more he'll learn to balance himself. It's purely inexperience. And again, this is where this grid really pays dividends. That it doesn't just teach the horse to be in control of his body, it also teaches the horse to be control of his balance. With multiple bounces, you've got to remember that really all these are is exaggerated strides. As we've discussed, that's exactly what the jump is. Keeping straight, off the seat, off the seat, off the seat. Very nice. Nice turn, looking at my fence early. Keep off the seat, going with the horse, but balanced, but balanced. Very good, turning right, good. We've now built number five obstacle in the grid. The fourth bounce. A Little bit of attention here and be very aware that in my experience I found that when you start to get to four and five or six bounces, it's nearly the straw that breaks the camel's back. Horses will panic a little bit for the first time when they get so many bounces in a row. Feel again what's happening with your horse. If he's starting to panic, stay at this level for a little longer. Don't be greedy. Don't be going for too much in one go. This will take a little practice before your horse becomes relaxed with so many bounces in one row. We've now got four in a row, five including the initial cross. Now this is where the horse really does have to think. As a rider we're keeping straight, going with the horse, keeping balanced. Very nice. The rain is challenging her concentration. A nice turn, looking up, keep nice and straight. Off the seat, off off, 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 off. Very nice, very nice. Good girl. Super. The last and final bounce in our grid. And you'll see by the time the horse gets to the end that it's really having to work quite hard all the way down there. As a rider, you'll feel the horse start to weave his body going down. Hopefully, your balance as a rider is still in tune with your horse. Remember, if you can keep balanced, your horse doesn't have to worry about you. If you're moving your body down this grid, the horse is not only having to do the bounces, but he's also having to try and balance you. The best thing to do maintain the jumping position, remembering to allow the knees to act as shock absorbers, and you'll nearly get to a point that when you go down the grid and you give the horse a pat, the horse will think, oh, forgot you were there. That's what we're aiming for, where you're so balanced with the horse, the horse only has to concentrate on his job. Very good position exercise, very good for getting the horse to work his front end, and again, it all links in to the round stride pattern for the horse. Very good for a rider's position, this. This is very good for a rider's position in that it helps you keep balance Go all the way down. Very good. Good girl. I'll do that one more time. Keeping the cog around the corner, looking at my fence early. Again, it's very good for the rider's balance. All the way down these bounces. 
Good girl. Very good. Very good. What I've done now is I've made a very short one stride double and I'd use this directly after the bouncers. We need the horse to be able to make the distinction between what is a bounce and a one stride. This double behind me, still using the cross pole effect, is only six yards long. In relative terms, that's half a stride in the center. One little tip, you'll see that I've used one of my flat planks on the floor to make the distinction of the one stride so as the horse cannot believe that it's a bounce. By using the cross poles directly after the diagonal bounces that we did, then the horse is having to really think, is this a cross or is it a bounce? And therefore we get him to be stimulated mentally. In other words, use his brain. This means that when you're in competition, not only are you thinking about jumping the fences correctly and properly, but your horse is as well. And that means you're both playing for the same side. You're both aiming towards the same goal. Like I said, I've made a one stride distance in here. But just to show you how short it would be normally. One, two, one, two, three, four. This is the one stride. We haven't allowed any takeoff, which is another two of my strides, obviously. So in actual fact, we know that it's a very short, in fact, half a stride in the center. By using the flat plank on the floor, what we're actually doing is we're defining the one stride. So the horse can't jump in and decide he's going to bounce. But by using this in conjunction with the multiple bouncers that we did, we're starting to say to the horse, this is a bounce, this is a one stride. By doing that, we're maintaining the balance. You'll notice that I'm using quite a large cross pole. This is to impress on the horse, but I want to see his reaction. Does it think, wow, this is a bigger fence, so I'm going to attack it? Or does it think, this is a bigger fence, so I should have a little more caution? We want our horses to think. We want our horses to be mentally challenged. But by the same token, you'll gauge a lot from your horse's reactions when you're doing this type of training. It's not really the height of the fence we're trying to work on here. It's developing his skills so as to help him make the right decisions. Indeed, a big cross pole is a very simple fence to jump, but it just looks bigger to the horse. Just the key to remember here, she's just been doing bounces. So this is the first time she's going to see this grid. I must not come in too big, too solid. Just a little bit waiting. She's going to have a little look. Let's see if she makes the right decision. Oh, lovely. Look at my fence very early. Remember, be disciplined. Don't come in too forward. See a long stride? Don't go on it. Just wait for the other one. Pop in, pop out. Super. Very good. We've now added a third part. And you'll notice that the last obstacle in this line is the biggest. Remembering what I said in video one about the way that a cross pole is designed. It, de it is designed to, to the horse to challenge him to make it look actually a lot bigger on first appearance than it actually is. And you'll notice that all of the cross poles we have here in the height, they're probably only a meter high, but the last one certainly looks to a horse a lot bigger than that. So we're actually challenging the horse mentally, but actually when he does the job, he'll find it a lot easier than what it first appeared he would do. Therefore, he'll build his confidence. That is so important that the training that we're doing is to not only aid you as a rider, give your horses the skills, but actually pour confidence into the horse, so when he goes into the ring, it's actually going to feel like he can do the job. By having 
three cross poles like this in a row on very short distances. What we're actually saying to our horses, they must back up, use their technique and be soft and not aggressive onto the fences. Not misinterpret any of these cross poles as bouncers, even though they're on very short one strides. And again, this is where the planks in the center aid us in our training because they define the one strides. But it's really again giving the horse the skills to make a choice. Is this a bounce or is this a short one stride? Oh, it's a short one stride. And as he does that, he's starting to think correctly. Rather than attacking and being aggressive, actually looking at the puzzle, working it out and being able to come to a successful conclusion. So now we've added the third part. Again, my balance must remain with the horse all the time. Don't go in too forwards, just nice. Let her work it out, let her work it out. Very good, land and go left. Look at my fence nice and early. Not going too big. Leave it, leave it, let us sort it out. Very nice, good girl. Good girl, good girl. Vitally important to praise your horse as well. Yeah, when they do the job right, nice pat, make a fuss. That way they start to understand the right and the wrong way. So what I've tried to show you there with the line that we've just done, starting off with the bounce work to make the horse use itself. Be supple through its back. Think what's happening. Feel the balance throughout. The rider maintaining position and not getting too far forward or too far back. Then rounding up and changing the line from instead of alternate bounces diagonally sloping to big cross poles on a very short stride. To say to the horse, now you've done bouncing, but here's one on a very short stride. What are you going to do about that? So as to give them all the ideas, all the knowledge to be able to go and jump the courses in control of their body, but also thinking what they're doing. We're going to go through now and look at more competition related things. Good girl. We've now come out into my jumping paddock and what we're going to do is look at various different designs of fences and the problems that might be associated with them. As a course builder, he's trying to create things that you have to understand to be able to jump your clear rounds. So we'll use various different designs and also little tricks that might be there to create problems for your horse. By understanding exactly what he's trying to create, you can then ride it better. I think we'll have a walk round and we'll look at the sort of things that you might encounter at shows. This is one of the first fences in our jumping paddock and you'll see it's got a, a picket fence type filler attached to it. But what makes this uh, very difficult for a horse is the fact that we've got such sharp contrasting colours. We've got a very dark blue with a very light white. White is predominantly quite difficult for a horse to see and pick up on. Okay, horses are talked about being colour blind. I think there's varying shades they pick up better than most. The strong colours help in their uh, uh, distinction of something. But the fact that this goes vertical and they can see directly through it gives them a little bit of uh, trepidation. Something that was more solid would help the horse a lot more because it would be very easy to identify. The fact that you can see through these gaps here would make this quite a difficult fence to jump. Being an oxer or a parallel is even harder for the simple reason that if the horse was to spook at the front filler, then he's actually got a little bit of width to work from. The way you have to ride these type of fences 
anything's a bit spooky, is don't attack. The more you push your horse into something that he's not sure of, the chances are the more he's going to back off. In other words, go away from your leg and you're going to end up being a little bit too far off, where you're actually asking for the horse to stand off and be brave, when he's clearly telling you that he's not sure. Keeping the contact, leg around. This is where we talk about keeping the horse between your hand and your leg. At a fence like this, that will give him the confidence that at least you're coming to it and you're not panicking. Don't panic. If you see a really long distance at a fence like this, i.e. a really long stride, wait for the next one. The chances are if you see a long distance, there's then going to be a little bit of a shorter and deeper distance behind it. Keep cool. That's the first thing. If you tell your horse that you're not sure, he's going to be not sure. If you're a little bit indecisive, he's going to feel that. So try to keep cool, keep your contact between your hand and leg, and you'll find that by you selling it to him in a confident fashion, the chances are a fence like this will make him be careful and aware, but won't make him stop. We now come to a Swedish Oxa. Some of you might know it is a St Andrew's Cross. The idea behind it, regardless of the name, is the same. It creates an optical illusion for the horse. The reason why it creates an optical illusion is very straightforward and simple. The horse, in the way that his eyes are set on the side of his head, gives him a very uh, wide angle of vision. The problem comes when he tries to focus on one object in particular. Ourselves, we've got eyes at the front of our head. And that's basically to do with the fact that we eat meat. So therefore, if you like, in our design structure, we had to focus on our prey to try to catch it, to try to eat it. And that gives us very good focusing powers. The horse, on the other hand, doesn't eat meat. It's a herbivore. So therefore, if you like, it was the prey. So his eyes were designed for survival, but in a very different way, to give him nearly all-round vision, 360-degree vision, so that he could see anything that was going to try and attack it. Like I said, the problem comes that he can see all around him, but he finds it difficult to focus on one object in particular. So what he does in that instance is he lowers his head and neck, runs his eyes along the floor to the point he's trying to look at. You'll often see a horse when he spooks that it will do that. Again, he's trying to work out exactly where the thing that he's looking at is in proximity to his body. So therefore, anything that's parallel to the floor, the horse will be able to judge. This is where the Swedish Oxer comes into its own. Because of the design structure, it slants from left to right in front and vice versa behind. The problem here is we've got nothing on the floor to help that horse, i.e. no ground line. The flowers that I've actually put in there are slightly behind the line of the fence. So the guides that the horse is using, i.e. the floor, is not really helping him. If this was horizontal to the floor, then that would help him. But it's not, it's sloping in the opposite directions. So all the guides that the horse uses to help him focus are slightly taken away from him here. In fact, it looks to the horse a little bit like the poles are swapping over. One minute's higher in front on the right, the next minute higher in front on the left. This actually is twice as difficult to jump due to the optical illusion effect than the normal fence at this height, purely because of the optical illusion effect. Course builders will use this specifically in classes where there might be a high entry, where they've got a height limit on something. Say if they're into a, a class of 125, but there's 100 entries. He's got to decide to create problems, but still maintain the 125 height limit. This is where these type of fences come into their own. It's only 125, but it's a lot more difficult to jump than the normal 125 Oxer because of the optical illusion effect. As a rider, the temptation would be to come to the small side in front. The problem is with that, because of the optical illusion look, the horse might think you're aiming him at the high side. Keep the central line, because throughout all of this, that's the one thing that remains the same. Keep the central line. Don't be tempted to go to left or indeed right. 
Also, if you've got a horse that likes to jump one side, be aware of these things. They can change. They don't have to be left to right sloping. They can be the other way. And if you've got a horse that jumps to the right or the left, one day you'll become, you'll come upon a Swedish oxer that unfortunately is built for the wrong side for you. So that's why it's really important in your initial training, you keep your horses straight. Like I said, the trick is to ride the direct line. And you'll find that if your horse has got confidence in you, he'll accept the optical illusion effect, no problem whatsoever. Viaduct walls. You've got a pair of viaduct walls here, underneath this oxer, this parallel. The reason why these cause problems is very simple. We've already discussed the way that a horse views things. He uses the floor as a guide. So therefore, anything along the bottom of the floor, if it's nice and solid, it will help the horse focus and let him know where the fence is. But here we've got holes that run all the way through. So therefore, he's deeply suspicious because if you like, this is a broken ground line because of the sharp contrasting colours, yet the holes in it, it's giving him a lot of suspicion because when he comes to it, he doesn't know whether it's a bold fence, but this doesn't help him focus directly. If this was just a plain wall without the viaduct walls, holes in there, then the horse would jump it a lot better because it would be a solid ground line. Anything that's broken along the floor in the ground line effect will cause problems. It doesn't give them perception to be able to focus on the jump. And again, course builders will use this type of thing with a back rail. So again, to put you under, as a rider, more pressure. Remember, do not panic. Keep the contact. Little bit of leg around the horse. If you can find somewhere to train your young horses over viaduct walls, gain their confidence and trust. It's things like this that help your preparation when you go to shows. Practice with different ground lines so the horse starts to accept your confidence and your instruction as to where the fence is rather than just totally relying on his eye. Because don't forget, the course builder might be trying to trick the horse. So that's where the training comes in, that the horse is very receptive, able to think for himself, but also very much used to listening to you. Keep your contact, keep a little bit of leg to it. Shouldn't give you too many problems. Now we've come to one riders hate, sets of planks. The reason why riders hate them so much is because they're normally on very, very, very flat cups. And that means, say, if the horse lays one little toe on it, it'll slide straight off and fall off. The horse doesn't know that. It's only the rider that knows they're on delicate cups. Because the rider knows that the planks are very delicate, they'll come with a lot more pressure, almost saying to the horse, don't touch these, they'll fall off too easily. When they do that, more likely to get the horse's head to rise. When he does, as he leaves the floor, with his head risen, his front end is more likely to dangle in that shape. Planks need a very good technique. That means to say, as a rider, the front end must be soft with the horse. Don't be too abrupt with your hands. If you try and snatch the horse off the floor, either the front end's gonna dangle like that, or indeed, his head's gonna come up and the back end will take them out behind. Remember, to a horse, these look quite solid, very broad, normally plain, painted in very sharp, very, very distinguishable colours. Nearly ride it the other way. Dare him a little bit, sir, dare you. Often, horses that uh, jump planks very well are the ones that are left more alone than the ones that try to be forced or cajoled by the rider over them. This is genuinely a rider's fence, not so much a horse fence. It is very horse friendly, very distinguishable colours, very solid in the way that it looks. The only thing that isn't solid is the little flat cups and only the rider knows that. So try to gain, be, keep your horses front end soft and allow the technique to develop from the front. Let your horse roll over the planks rather than trying to force him to be careful and indeed that it might have the adverse effects. Here's a, here's a fence that really demonstrates show jumping, how it's evolved. A few years ago, 10, 15 years ago, fences were very red and white, blue and white. 
normally had very solid brushes at the bottom, long wide poles, fences that you could really ride to. Monday show jumping, they've worked very much on the idea of getting the horse to be more intelligent and the rider to be more well trained and balanced. Not so much forcing the horse over a big jump, more delicate type of jumps and testing the horse's mentality. Can he work it out? You'll see by this fence that we've got here, little light square poles, the black line running through the middle, the whole thing stacking up, very confusing. But here we've made a double of it, so it sort of shouts at the horse, can you work me out, can you work me out? Very light poles on the top, the horse has got to be super careful here. These fences have really come into their own now, certainly on the continent where they're trying to work out which horses can use their brains. And that's why it's vitally important when we're training our horses, we are testing him in the mental department. As you see here, there's a nice solid ground line, but the fact that all the lines are nearly mishmashing into one, the optical illusion is, is really as if it's a blanket of black and white lines. Very di difficult for the horse to focus exactly where the fence is. This takes a horse to have a lot of uh, trust in the rider. But again, going back to what I mentioned earlier about a horse having a systematic approach, not attacking at the first instance, trying to work out the puzzle. These type of fences are all there to try and see which horses can do that. As a rider, you have to come down without pace. If you came in too forward to this, too strong, expecting the horse to back up, you're going to have a big mishap. You've got to come in with a very much more concertina canter, closed up. Let the horse be able to see it and work it out. Remember, he won't be able to distinguish what's here till probably only about a stride away. It's only about 12 feet plus the takeoff. So he will see it right at the last minute. The more you drive him in with speed, the more chances are he'll make a mess up of it because he won't see it until really late. As I said, this is more modern day show jumping where they're testing every tool in your box to see whether the horse has trained correctly, thinking the right way and has confidence and trust in its rider. And that's the reason why we do the training that we do. Very difficult fence to jump. The Liverpool water ditch. A lot of people have different names for it. Causes a lot of problems. The problem here is, again, the horse using the floor in this instance, we've actually got a portable water jump. But let's just say this was permanent. The same situation arises. It's a broken ground line at the bottom. The horse views this with a lot of suspicion. He's using the floor as his guide. Any ditch, any water tray, anything like this on the floor is interrupting his focus. He's making him actually stand off a lot further because he's viewing this. He'll be looking down at that but the jump's up here. Actually, if you think about it logically, it shouldn't really come into play. I can stand in this because there's no water, but if I was to show you where the takeoff point would be normally, we're here. That's where he will take off from. So again, the ditch doesn't come really into play. And the same the other side, he's going to land far enough out. In actual fact, he'll exaggerate it because he'd be a little bit worried that he's going to step in the, uh, the Liverpool. Ride it with a lot of panache into your hand. What you mustn't do, and a lot of riders do wrong, when they ride to this fence, they ride forward, and then they drop their hands. And the horse looks down into it and then ends up stopping, sliding into it. When I talk about panache in the hand, I mean a nice, solid contact. Almost as if you're holding a child's hand. Come on, it's okay, it won't hurt you. Yes, you come riding around with a, a good, solid contact, plenty of leg. Don't ask for a long distance. Again, you're asking for the horse to be brave, when in actual fact he's telling you he's not sure. You can't get too deep to this fence, because as you see, even there, which is normal takeoff, he thinks that's quite close. So you can come with a contact, with plenty of leg, but don't go on the long distance. Don't see a long stride to this, because the chances are the horse won't pick up from it. Hopefully, by you having a contact, the horse is going to be able to judge the top rail. The one key area here, I wouldn't dream of coming to a fence like this on a young horse. What I would do is train him. And what we do here is we would fold that portable water, 
so it's only about this wide. And we will pop over it with a very small fence. And again, to instill his confidence, and they would open it out. Preparation at this stage is vital. If you ride down to a big water jump or a big fence like this, when it's never seen it before, it's probably going to take fright and be frightened of it. And then you've got a real problem. Build your horse's confidence. Train him. I've bought a purpose-built water here, but actually a little bit of blue carpet. Even some of the DIY shops have a tarpaulin that's blue, where you can fold it up. And as long as you make sure the edges are not going to blow up as the horse is jumping, you can pop that and use that as a, as a portable type of water. Training is the key here. You wouldn't dream of coming to a fence like this with a young horse or a horse that's never seen it before. On a horse that's trained, confident, this shouldn't cause any problems. That's the reason why we've got it at home, so we can actually train with it. The water jump. Big problem for a lot of riders and a lot of horses, unfortunately. First, thing think it's important to understand what the water jump is about. There's two elements, really. I suppose the main element is to test the horse's ability to be brave, to stretch, to take on the water. The second element is for the rider, whether or not it disrupts the rhythm. The course builder might use the water jump in conjunction with certain fences maybe a flimsy vertical on a related distance afterwards, or indeed a short distance to the water to test the rider's ability to be able to lengthen and shorten his horse. So there are two aspects. I think it's very important to discuss the water straight away. Most water jumps are anything between 12 and 16 feet at championship level wide. Now that sounds quite a wide jump, and indeed at championship level it is. But let's put it in context with the horse's stride. Even at 16 feet, that is only a stride and a quarter. If you think the horse takes off a little closer to the fence, because it's obviously not as high, the rider can position him closer. And he lands even six to uh, 10 inches on the landing side, which clearly misses the tape, but gets over the water no problem. He's only actually having to take probably stride and a quarter, stride and a, uh, a third maybe. If you want to put that into human context, it's probably the equivalent of a four foot six leap, which is not as bad as what it first might appear. As a rider, what you've got to do is you've got to get the horse going forward. A nice long forward type of canter. Don't go flat out gallop with the reins flapping at it because that's more likely to make your horse panic. Try to get a good cog, in other words, a nice, solid, going forward canter, so then you can have a little bit of contact, which will give your horse confidence and be able to ride off the boards, which are these things. What we try to do is to get as close as we can to them. Obviously, the closer we are, not as far to get to the other side. When we're training, you'll see that I use poles over the top. This is to encourage our horses to get height. Exactly the same as a long jumper does when he runs up to do his long jump. The first thing he does when he hits the board, i.e. the takeoff point, is to try and get height. Combine that with the speed, then he gets the length. If you get too much forwardness and flatness in your canter, the chances are you're not going to be as accurate in your distance so there's no point in having a really long canter, but then taking off a long way away from the water. So what you try to do is get a good solid canter, going forward in a very active rhythm, then try to place the horse as close as you can to the boards to be able to ride off them. A Little bit of leg when you get there. Hopefully your horse will be trained to make a nice high jump over the water. Then when he lands, hopefully he'll not be on his forehand and running. So therefore, if the course builder has used a fence afterwards, it's not going to cause you problems either. Little tip, we train the horses to start with over the portable waters using these type of boards. The transition then to a big water is not as great. Don't wait till it's too late before you start training your horses over water. 
as a young horse, if they can pop one on a regular basis, and I mean a little narrow, four or five feet water, they'll have the confidence to take on the big waters when they get to a seven and eight year old stage in their careers. The trick is, again training, but preparation. A lot of riders, they go to a show and they say, I don't know what it's like when it, when it jumps water, I've never done it before. And that's ridiculous. Try to put a little bit of time and effort into training the young horse over small waters, and then as you get further up their experience level, the big waters shouldn't have any problems. As a rider, try to be accurate rather than just go for all out pace. What a lot of course builders do in their course designing is they use the natural rise and fall of the gradient of the ground to again create problems for you as a rider. And I'm going to use my Devil's Dyke here that we have at home to train over to illustrate that. Bearing in mind the ground is what the horse uses to focus on, something coming down the hill means that the horse will be following the contour of the ground. But that means to say that he's probably going to be running closer to the fence. It'll draw him in, as it were, make him be too deep because he's following the ground, working away from him. A fence going up the hill is going to have the opposite effect because the ground is almost coming to meet him it's going to make him stand off it a little bit, again because of his lack of focus. The rule of thumb is going down the hill pulls you into the bottom. Going up the wheel hill means that you're more likely to be further off. The problem is, and this is really the key now, that when you're coming down the hill, the one thing you don't want to be is too close. But the hill is pulling you that way. When you're going up the hill, the one thing you don't want to be is too far away from the fence. But again, that's what the ground is doing to the horse. So you as a rider have really got to alternate your pace here to help you. What I mean by that is, if you're going and riding a fence up the hill, ride with a little bit more strength and solidness to your canter. A little bit more quality, a little bit more strength. Not so much speed and certainly not too much length, but a little bit more panache to the canter. When you're coming down a hill, soften. And by doing those things, what will happen is the gradient effect will take it off or add depending on whether you're going up or down the hill. Bearing in mind that the course builder's job is really to cause you problems. Not that are going to create uh, accidents, but are going to actually stop you jumping clear rounds. The more you're able to understand different types of fences, different types of design, and certain reasons why things happen, means that you're more in a position as a rider to do something about it. The one key aspect is training. And the whole point of what we're doing with the video is to try to show you that by successful training, it leads to successful show jumping. We'll go on and do some jumping now and start to discuss line work. What we're going to talk about now is what we call a related distance on a dog leg. Now this is something that uh, starts to occur more and more in a technical course where the course builder will set two fences slightly on an angle and as a result of which he's making the rider determine the line. Also there is a, a little rule of thumb which you have to adhere to when you're walking and riding a dog leg distance and what I feel a lot of people make the mistake of is they walk the distance as if it was in a straight line and interpret it that way. There's a dog leg rule, if you like, which we have to adhere to. And that gives us the correct answer to, if you like, the question that the course builder sets us. We're going to go and walk the distance and I'm going to actually show you how I've seen it walk by a few riders and they've had problems. And then I'll show you the correct way to walk the distance. The first thing you have to do when you take into account a dog leg distance, and in this situation today, we've just got a red vertical going to a red vertical, is you'll be coming around on the right rein. So what you'll be doing is you're meeting this square. Now what I've seen a lot of riders do 
when they walk the distance between these type of fences, is they do something like this. One, two, this is where the horse is going to land. One, two, three, one stride, one, two, three, two stride. And then they make a sharp turn, two, three, three strides. And you'll see how acute that was. And, and I, I always ask the, the riders when they do this, you know, how do you know that this is the spot where you should turn? Do you put a, a little mark on the floor or drop a little hanky on the floor and say, when I hit X, that's where I'm going to turn? The other problem is with that, that you've got to look at it from a horse's perspective. It jumps that fence, it lands, and the rider is keeping going straight. The problem is the rider might know that they're going to that red vertical there, but the way they're aiming the horse, the horse is thinking that that is not even in its eye line. It's no way is it going to that fence. And then all of a sudden they turn it here and the horse goes, my word, we're coming to that, are we? And it all gets a little bit pear shaped. Plus by making such a sharp and acute turn, in something like this, the horse is bound to unbalance. Just because you know where you're going, it's vitally important that you sell that to your horse. You've also got to remember that when you're riding this distance here, you've got to try to maintain the rhythm because the course builder has made the angles, as it were, to try and disrupt your rhythm. The other thing, again, when you're walking a course, is you must always look at where you're going because that's how you're going to ride it. And again, I've seen this happen before where a, a rider has walked a course and done something like this. Two, one, three, one. Oh! One, two, two strides. Oh! And they're that busy concentrating on their feet, they're actually not walking a very true line, or indeed a line which they can possibly ride. The way to walk a line like this is that you must think how a horse thinks. And it goes something like this. Stand to the centre. Hopefully this is where you're going to jump it. You walk. One, two. This is where the horse will land. Looking directly at the next obstacle, start your turn almost immediately. Now you saw there that even in the first stride, I'm already starting the turn. Now at this point, the horse has gone one stride and he's thinking, oh, I wonder if we're going to red vertical. One, two, three, two strides. The horse is now absolutely 100% sure, yes, we are going to the red vertical. So even in that short turn there, and you can see how smooth it was, the horse is now totally aware that that is going to be the next fence. And don't forget, the rider that walked the acute turn, at this point the horse is still not aware that he's going to the red fence. He's pointing totally in the wrong direction. One, two, three, four. This is our third stride here. And again, nicely presented for the fence. One, two, three, four. This is our fourth stride. And as you can see, it's a long way away from the fence. One, two, three, four. This is our fifth stride. What we know by walking the distance in this way, that on the natural line, it actually walks four and a half strides exactly. Now the horse can't take a half stride and possibly jump the fence. So what we've got to do is we've got to make a decision. Do we take four strides a little forward? or do you indeed take five strides? Now, this is where the dogleg rule really comes into its own. The dogleg rule, like I said, is basically there that something that happens in a dogleg. And basically what happens is that because of the turn, the horse's stride just shortens approximately this much per stride, a very small amount. But the other thing, because the horse isn't quite sure where he's going, He'll just slightly hang back off the bridle. What that means is that a horse riding or riding a distance on a dog leg will actually ride a little bit longer than it walks. So in actual fact, for this distance here to be walking 
four and a half, it will actually ride more like four and three quarters because of the dogleg rule. The horse taking a slightly shorter stride within the turn and the fact that the horse is not sure where he's quite going, so he might just take back a little bit off the bridle. So even though it walks four and a half, it's actually going to ride more like four and three quarters. When we know that, we can then make a better decision on what we're going to take on our horse. Knowing that that walks four and a half, but actually rides four and three quarters, would make the five strides then the favourite. If indeed this was a speed class and we wanted to go four strides, then what we'd have to do then is ride more of an acute and direct line so as to take the curl out of the distance. If this was a particularly uh, difficult distance, for whatever reason here, we could easily take six by making more of an outer line. We talked in video one and two about canter, rhythm and line, and this is where the line really comes into its own. We always walk the center to center line, and then depending on what that is, we either ride the line outside the line if you want to create more space and if you want to take space i.e take the stride out we walk inside line the more practice you get at being able to walk and execute a line the more chances are that you will ride it correctly and you'll ride a game with confidence what i'm going to do today is i'm actually going to ride this normally on the five and then i'm going to go on the four and show you the distinction between the normal five stride line and the four stride line. Because remembering, when you're making that decision, not only must it suit your horse, but it also must work in with what you're trying to do. There's no point in going four strides down here if, you, if you're in a, a, a class where this is a particularly flimsy fence, because then the risk factor is far too great. On the other hand, if it was a speed class and you wanted to be competitive, five strides would waste too much time. So again, it's really a question of distinguishing exactly what's best for your horse, what the distance is, and then the execution of that line and stride pattern. So I'm going to ride this distance. On the dog leg, it walks four and a half, but actually with the dog leg rule, it'll be more like four and three quarters. Centre to centre, nice smooth line, centre, look at my next fence, one, two, three, four, five, jump the fence. Very simple. Good boy. Perfect. Good boy. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to outside line it and make six. But rather than shortening the stride, I'm just going to outside line. Use the line rather than shortening the stride. So now I shall make a, a more rounded line out. Again, centre to centre. One, two, three, four, five, six. And there you would have seen a wider line. Not so much a shorter stride pattern, just a wider line. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come very direct and take the stride out. But if you notice it, and I do it correctly, then I shouldn't have to extend too much. I'm just making the line work for me. One, two, three, four. So just that little example there of by opening, normal and closing the line, you can make the same distance seem to be three very different things. But by being able to gauge it, walk it, and take into account the dogleg rule. 
means that you make the right decision for your horse, for the circumstances, and for a clear round. And that's what it's all about. Boy. We've come outside into the jumping paddock to jump a course. We're going to use some of the jumps that we talked about earlier and I'm going to give you a commentary as I'm going round. You've got to remember that when you're jumping a course, you're always trying to plan it out. When you walk the course, make sure of your distances and then try and execute in your course riding. As I'm going around, I will be talking to camera and these are the sort of things that are going through my mind as I'm riding around any course throughout Europe. It's really important that when you're riding a course, you've got a very clear picture in your mind of what you're trying to do. But by the same token, you've got to be able to take everything into account. Gradient, jump type, and the way that the horse is going, whether it's going a little spooky, a little too forward. Like I said, the course that we're going to attempt to jump in a second is a little bit more technical. It's got all the type of fences that we discussed earlier. And you'll see the different variations in not only my ride, but also my commentary with regards to how I'm approaching the fence and what sort of things I'm thinking are important. Good girl. Okay, we're coming to the first fence. First job I must do is get a good quality canter. Looking at the fence nice and early, it's the blue oxer. Now, she could have a spook at the front rail, so I'll keep a nice little contact in my hand. Oh, a lovely jump. Make a nice change of rain. Four strides, a little up the hill. So, squeeze, one, two, three, and just wait. Beautiful, little change of leg. Now, I'm coming down the hill now to the planks. So, just let the fence come to me. Don't be in a hurry. Nice and soft, let her jump it. Good, flying change, the next fence the red oxer. Don't panic. Very nice jump. Super jump. Now we come inside now. Round to the combination. We've got to let her know where she's going. Don't get too heavy in my hand. Keep her balanced. Right, so one stride and then two strides. Doubles the next fence. Now Look at this, don't want to come in too forward. I'm waiting, keeping my body up. <coughs> Getting balanced out. The next fence is my red vertical. Just checking it, looking it through. It's a five stride distance on the dog leg then to the Swedish Oxer. So, a bit deep here, so. Forward, two, three, four, five. Lovely jump, nice jump. Relaxing around the turn, water ditch. Leg on, keeping it between my hand and leg. Lovely jump. Just got to now get a nice and soft. Brown fence is my last fence. Very important that she doesn't drop off my hand here. In other words, doesn't think that she's finished already. Let her know nice and early where she's going. Straight in and lovely. Very nice round. Good girl. When you've jumped your clear rounds, it's then time for the jump off. I'm now going to try and give you some helpful tips on being speedier in your jump offs. But be warned, you can only go as fast as you can jump clear. There is no point whatsoever in being the fastest time with all the jumps on the floor. So what I'm going to try and show you is the ways that you can be speedy, you can be quick, you can be economical within your route, but by the same token you remain balanced and you're able to present the horse good enough to jump the fence clear. With practice you'll get quicker. But you've got to remember, whenever you're doing a jump off, it's the shortest route that wins. Less strides means quick. If you go round jumps fast, the chances are 
you're taking not only the longer route, but you're getting longer in your stride pattern. And therefore, you're more likely to have a fence down. So the eco most economical route is normally the fastest, and therefore the winner. Two things I want to show you. We've got two turns that we use. I'm going to show you, and I'm going to use the Cavaletti, just cantering around the Cavaletti, and show you the first turn. What we're trying to do within our turns is keep bend, as in that distinction there, so that the horse's hocks remain engaged. So therefore we can maintain power. Now that type of turn we'll use when we're turning back to a fence where we want to keep the horse together, but on a tight line, so we actually, when he gets the fence, he's still able to jump it. We'll call that the A turn. And that's the one with bend, where the horse is maintaining engagement and keeping nicely balanced and bending around your leg. I'm going to show you that now, around the Cavaletti. So as you can see here, horse is just bending around my leg, supporting him, keeping him balanced. Nice tight turn. He's bending round my leg. These are tight turns. But he's able to maintain the power throughout. And I'm not having to support him in that. I'll just change the rein. And do the same on this rein. So it's coming through the turn, nicely balanced, maintaining bend, and keeping his engagement behind. Obviously having to take a shorter stride pattern because he's making a very sharp turn. But as you notice, keeping himself engaged and coming through from behind. That's the A turn. Oh, good boy. Now the B turn is totally different. This turn we use when we may be turning after a fence, where we want to get to the next fence very quickly. Normally on a turn back, where you jump a fence and then have to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to show you this turn, and I'm going to show you this turn in walk for the start, because when it happens quickly, you probably won't see it. Now you saw in the A turn, we created bend, made the horse go around our leg, keeping him engaged behind. With the B turn, what we're going to do is we're going to keep a contact in the outside hand, a little rein pressure, keeping the neck straight where he falls through the shoulder to a certain extent where he does a little turn on the haunches. So something along the regions of that, where on walk. So we walk him up, little rein pressure in the outside, little leg pressure in the outside, he falls away and walks forward. Again, outside, falls away, walks forward. Now I'm going to show you that in canter. I'll use this green fence as a, as a guide. So I use the outside hand and turn back and ride forwards. Change of leg, outside rein, ride forwards. Change the leg, outside leg, ride forwards. Change the leg, outside rein, ride forwards. Whoa. And you'll see there, completely different turn. One, he's keeping engagement behind, the A turn. And he's keeping rhythm around his turn. The B turn, he more or less falls through the shoulder turns on his haunches, falls through his shoulder, and goes forwards. But you can see the speed of that type of turn. Just by falling away, he's gone before you know where he was. As a rider, it's very difficult to maintain balance in that situation. So what I've got to do is I've got to be very prepared for that type of turn. I'm now going to use this green fence here, and I'm going to show you the ty two types of turn one leading into it and one leading away from it. So as again, you can see the speed, but also the balance. One is a question of trying to jump the fence clear. The other one is getting to the next fence very quickly so as to make sure that I'm up on the clock.
So we're going to use the A turn where we keep the horse engaged, proper balance around my leg, fence, and then B to ride away. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you three types of turn. The A turn here, going back into the vertical. Another A turn over the oxa, where then I'm going to do a B turn, a very sharp turn, and try and turn back inside the gate. Then I'm going to finish and jump the last fence on the angle. And what I have to do there when I'm riding a fence on the angle is let the horse know very quickly, very early where it's going, and then maintain contact in both hands. Don't try and pull it in, otherwise it'll run to one side or the other. If you like, funnel in it. Funnel it, in other words, both hands, contact, let it know where it's going so that you keep that nice, direct approach. Even though it's on the angle, the horse should be able to pick it up and with confidence in the rider, take the fence on and the angle will again mean speed. Okay, so we're going to do, turn back to the green. Onto the red. Inside the gate, on the angle, last fence. So there we are. We've come to the end of the third video in this three-part series, Successful Show Jumping. I hope you find something useful to help you jump those clear rounds. So, good luck. I hope to see you at the shows.